From the home offices of Ash and Flow, this is Unbillable Hours, a podcast about professional services marketing. Stick around and listen to our insights, tips, and best practices to improve your firm's marketing and even your career. All right. There here we are, Ash. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome back to this new episode of the Unbillable Hours podcast. Brought I to think... you on a Friday between two, a weekend and a holiday for, for lots of people, right? Both in the US and Europe. Yeah, and actually, one of the things I, I want to start with is thank all the people who joined us live for our, you know, open session, almost like yeah. a webinar. And we hope to see more of you because we had quite an interesting discussion, but not exactly the topics that we in it initiated. Like we talked about things that we knew the market was interested in, but we got questions on certain details. Yeah. yeah. And, and so we thought let's come together this Friday where everybody's taking a day off <laughs> yeah. and record, record this to to follow up on a couple of the questions we got during during the live session because i agree i also want to say thank you to everybody who attended it was that was a nice nice occasion great discussion also and i think maybe people have listened to it as, as a podcast recording but if you did you you might have realized we got a couple of questions around picking marketing channels and which channels should we be on and where should we market i think the 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 reason behind those questions always being maybe people feel that what they're currently doing in marketing isn't as a factor if it doesn't give them as much of a reach or i don't know as, as optimal as conversions as they'd like to have and then the question quickly turns to what else should we do which other channels should we pick which we want to step in and say i think ash that that's actually not the best way to approach it i mean it's an understandable question and and it's fair enough to ask but the 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 differentiated answer is yes there is benefits to being on many channels and we live in a multi-channel multi-touch blah world but the reality yeah. of it is unless you are one of the big firms or a marketing team with plenty of resources probably you will not be able to execute across all the channels or many channels or whatever so so what should you do instead right Let, yeah actually uh, you know what let let's bring this to something that we've been advising people in general like if you are a professional services firm we've always talked about like streamlining your offerings so that you basically don't sell everything in the world because you can't go ahead and solve for every all of that you need to focus on yeah. and like build your offerings based upon like what your strengths are what is required in the market and go by the whole you know supply and demand thing in the same way you may or may not have the resources to hit every channel. Even if you do have the resources to hit every channel, every channel is not worth it. Like I know this is like calling something out, but generally if you're in professional services, Pinterest is not where your audience lies, though they could make it beneficial to professional services through list kind, listing kind of things. But generally, professional services and pinterest is not a thing so the same way you need to focus on uh you know the right yeah. channel yeah but i mean let's let's so let's walk through the the answers we have prepared because i think we, we said it on a live uh that the, the first trick is just change your mindset a little bit and don't think so much about what's the right channel what are the right tactics but take like 10 steps back and ask who do we want to speak to and what do we want to say in the first place right that's that's where it starts yeah. and and you and i agreed upon not going down that road because that's probably an episode in and by itself but but just very briefly right if you can be very clear about who this is for and this goes to your point about focusing on the offerings right who, who needs to hear about this and you can then have some hypothesis around what what are their pain points you can then go into some clear answers like how how would you as the expert or you as the consulting firm help to remedy those pain points and that you know that sort of that points to the content you'll be probably writing about. And as unless that is not very clear and very well defined, and it doesn't have to be perfect, but it has to have it has to be a very pointed hypothesis, right? You can say we think 
this is for X people who have Y pain points and they will like Z solutions. You need, right? And then we can validate as we go into the channel and post the content, but that, that's that's where it starts, I think. And then Ash, you had yeah. something, to, you noted something here about the types of content you want. Yeah, to but even about. for the types of content, I think I would like to say, this is a space where your USP, your unique selling proposition rests. Because as you are building out your content, people need to know why you, right? And so when you're looking at the you know types of content you go, think about the audience, right? You have your C-suite and you have the minus ones, minus twos, et cetera, the subject matter experts, as you would say, yeah. Flo. And the thing is, they're both being talked to, but the kind of messaging that hits both of them is different. The C-suite messaging should be more high level, top level kind of messaging that gives them like the big picture, the horizon event, that kind of thing, because that's yeah. the thing that they'd be looking for. The others need to see much more of the detail. Even if the C-suite sees that, you and I are fully aware that most likely they will just hand this over to their people, their staff, yeah. and ask them to like highlight what's the key points and see if this is useful for them or not, because yeah. they will make the decision <clears throat> And they'll make an informed decision, but these are the people who do that. So you can, instead of just going the roundabout way, you can literally go in the way of like hitting your subject matter experts, your topical experts, your uh, the people who ladder into these decision makers because yeah. they would love to find these kinds of, kind of information because, hey, at the end of the day, they need to impress their bosses. They need to be knowledgeable and this kind of information targeting them makes them look good and makes them more likely to build that relationship yeah. with you. So and definitely I, I focus on that. And I think like if you pitch like business case strategic type content to the C-suite, right? Um, educate them about how you, I don't know, yeah. save the business money, make the business more money. There's not a, you know, there's not a, it's not as if there's too many options for consulting does at the end of the day, but but what they will need is they will need the confidence that you're not just talking about these things and promise them, but you, that you're able to deliver, right? And the way you do that is, Ash, what you just said is you, you also have in the weeds content, right? Technical stuff, which maybe the C-suite decision maker doesn't even understand, right? There's not many CEOs being super deep in, I don't know, data science, right? But um, if you share technical stuff, which which their technical people can understand so that they can vet you, right? Once the CEO, to your point, Ash, turns around and, and asks, hey, this consulting firm, are they legit? You know, do, do they, is there a high likelihood of them actually delivering what they promise here? Then these people will be able to support the decision-making process in your favor by saying, yeah, I've read their stuff on data science. Seems very good. But, you know, so you, you need these two things. And to... To again make that point, I think that's really where it has to start. Don't ask what's the right channel. Ask what, who do we speak to, and what's the right message, right? And and I think we should we should maybe in the in the future do a very tactical episode on how to define those things, Ash. Right? But um, yeah, yeah, I, I yeah. do want to just add the fact that on speaking about technicality, it also depends upon the audience. Clearly, in some audience cases, like say mm. the chemicals industry, you need to be really technical. In some other audiences. For instance, the communications industry, you need to be a little less because the people who are implementing it, like the hands-on yeah. guys, they're way, way further than these levels of decision makers. So you have to know your audience fully within your industry, your sector, your function before you go for it. Yeah. Um, which, I mean, that goes back to the other point we always make is that how you have to involve your own subject matter experts into the content creation, right? But we said we didn't want to do too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not going so so it, I'm forcing yes. myself to move on. So so once we have the hypothesis done, right, who we speak to, what do we say, what's the message essentially, then you can have some hypothesis around distribution. And um, you, you said Pinterest probably not the place, right? And you don't, you don't even need like super hard data on this. Just have some educated guesses on where your audience hangs out. To be very honest, in the B2B space, probably LinkedIn is just your, your safest bet. Um, maybe some other social channels could be good. And don't even just stick with social, right? Make a like a full sweep, like what newspapers do they read? Maybe what TV shows do they enjoy? Whatever. Yeah. You want to you wanna just have a complete picture there. The important part, though, is, and we had this come up in the live, if the objection then becomes, well, but the CEOs I'm targeting, they are not on LinkedIn. Um, that's, again, when we get back to your point about the, the other audiences, the people who letter up into the CEO, CMO, whatever, uh, the influencers, 
they they will be it's just it's just reality and i mean everybody can 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 think about their own lives how often has it happened to you that you found something in some social channel where you hang out that you thought was so compelling that you shared it with someone else uh who's not even in that channel like i do get instagram video clips from people through whatsapp i'm not on instagram or i think I am technically, but I'm not, you know, anyways, right. And I, and I sometimes share stuff for, like I send you things, Ash, I see on TikTok, yeah. right. Which, so th these things are very real and it's worth to not forget them. So I think the point when I say yeah. distribution is with your content and audience definitions, go as narrow as you can for the distribution, then broaden it out a little. And you made the point during the live session, Ash, by, by don't just think about the primary audience, but also think about the people who influence them. As you yeah. distribute, right? I would actually like to like simplify this to just say do a word of mouth analysis. By by what I mean that is pick up your key level one, level two, level three influences, see where they get their information from, and then build your distribution tactic based off of that. It might not be LinkedIn, it could be Facebook, it might not be Facebook Facebook, it could be Instagram, it could be yeah. maybe just like you know the whatsapp crm kind of you know stuff it, it could be any of those so make sure that you are poised to have conversations in those distribution spaces and it could be digital could be face to face could be anything but this can only be done by using a word of mouth analysis and that requires you to have a, a bit of a qualifying conversations an easy way to do this is when you send out your qualitative or quantitative surveys always find out where are the spaces that your audience engages? You ask a lot of questions about, like, I, I, I get a lot of surveys from lots of people, you know, about like C-suite stuff and like big decision making things. One of the key things I always find is that they never ask me where have I found this information. They always ask me, are you aware of this? Do you know of this? All that kind of stuff. But if I'm a decision maker, they need, or influence the decision maker, they need to ask me, where did I find this? Because yeah. that is going to help, like, you know, focus and, your distribution. And then, yes. And then once you have these sources, obviously you want to pick a channel that also where they spend time. And, and we will get to the point, our next point is just pick a single channel to start. So let's be clear. Yeah. Don't pick a bazillion channels, right? Here are some influences. Here are some influences. Here's where the actual primary audience goes to. No, no, no. Pick a channel where all of these groups and intense overlap so pick linkedin i'm just just kidding but you get the point right there are there are certain places where everybody goes if if we talk newspapers the wall street journal and the financial times are still pretty big in business world right so mm -hmm. that that would be the equivalent of that so there's a high likelihood of you hitting 80 percent of the primary audience secondary audience, whatever on, on those channels just one one thing to your to this influencing thing i wanted to to drop because because sometimes it's not just who do these the decision makers get the information from directly or who is who is influencing them because the influence is part of the decisioning process but sometimes there can be uh, allies or let's call them i don't know interest groups within a client's organization that are not even in the decision making process and the, the best example i have of this is i recently had a conversation with someone told me the story how they started to distribute messaging around cyber risk cybersecurity consulting and like the strategy mm -hmm. stuff in software developer communities. And to be clear, for this particular service offering they were selling, they typically speak to the chief security officer or compliance people, so forth. Though they don't talk to developers. It's not the target audience. And developers are often not in the decision-making process when that particular firm gets hired to do consulting work. However, they figured that lots of software developers are fed up with the security by design, whatever that's called, policies inside their company. So the, the developers are an interest group. They want better security processes so that they can go through the development faster and get less harassment for security concerns later in the development process. Right. So that, that was an interesting insight they had. And so they sort of built support, awareness, you know, people championing them in the, inside the prospects organizations with developers who... Other than that, do not have much to do with the process. And the way the story was told to me, that's quite a successful strategy. I'm not saying that's you know on that makes sense for thing. everybody, but but it was interesting to hear that is sometimes uh, friends can live in remote places, so to speak, right? <clears throat> in that particular case, what I would 
also suggest is do something called GitHub adjacency marketing. So people always search for GitHub codes and they don't necessarily have to be the developers. It could be the bosses who are suddenly trying to f figure out what the hell yeah. these guys have been doing. So always focus on like GitHub adjacency spaces, which means in the searches that they do for specific things in yeah. like, ways that people enter a github repository and all those kinds of things those are the areas where you can clearly like position messaging yeah so again Thank yeah you. no but, but it's good stuff because i mean the, the main point you bring for a second point so first figure out what you have to say then think about where to distribute it and in thinking about that be a bit broader right and maybe a bit creative and think about who else might be having conversations similar to those you want to have Mm -hmm. with the decision makers and try to get those people as well next step though right that being said i know i already pointed to it start with just one channel and and this is me presuming you you have a small marketing team or a, or a mid-sized firm if you don't have all the resources of the world don't do everything at once just pick one pick the one where you think the propensity of success is, is actually flow mm -hmm. even even if you have a large marketing team get one you know get one person to focus on a channel at yeah, a time yeah. and it's the same thing it's just like don't get one person to like focus on five channels because yes they may get the umbrella messaging but what happens is yeah. their efforts get distributed <clears throat> Pe keep people temporarily on a channel thing and then build it up Do, uh, i'm not saying make someone as a linkedin marketer only that's not what i'm saying i'm saying while they're running yeah. like a campaign Make sure that the focus for an individual is just this as you test it out before you, you know, push things out. And so this is for and, larger firms. And adding to that, since you mentioned larger teams, uh, and you you spoke before in some other episode about just killing or stopping things, that there might be merit in just not doing channels anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Presuming you have lots of them, which which aren't working. Like a, a typical example for clients I work with, they always and because we have. Xing or Crossing or whatever the platform's called, it's basically a German LinkedIn competitor. Yeah, I know what Xing is. Yeah. Who is is pretty defunct nowadays. Lots of firms I work with still maintain a presence there, and they have it on LinkedIn, and they're sort of cross posting. But then it's the question: Do we have to translate our English stuff for Xing into German? Yada yada. So there's lots of work that goes into the Xing channel, and then if you look at it, the Xing channel doesn't do much. So uh, in these cases, I'm not I'm not saying flat out always kill it, but there might be cases where you have sort of withering Instagram channel or whatever. You know, consider dropping it and, and focus because, and this is the next, or this is goes into this single channel tip. Try to figure out in that single channel you focus on whether you can get it to really work. And it by it we mean get the content, the messaging to resonate and mm -hmm. and prove that out. And this is where it gets a bit mushy because you'll have to look for qualitative signals, right? With let's stick with the LinkedIn example. Like, are the posts seen by people with the right in the right companies? With the right job titles do we get positive signals a like or two three likes a share whatever right um like take these early signals to determine that what you're doing is actually kind of working and built upon that and then also obviously you should see over longer time periods lots of graphs trending upwards and to the right right impressions go up likes shares uh c follows in the company page and whatnot right but really focus to get the one channel to work and I would include into that, maybe even bring paid into the mix so, and experiment yeah, with it, yeah. right? Because what, what paid distribution of content you'd otherwise play just organically allows you to do is you can see things like click through rates and so forth. And you can Google the benchmarks for that. Once you're at or above benchmark, that's also a strong signal of what you're putting out there is sort of working for you. And I would never add even half another channel before I have that stuff sorted for the primary channel I'm focusing on. So I, I do, this is slightly tactical, but I think this is relevant. So when you're focusing on local versus global marketing and you're looking at like a local versus global channel, you have to understand what you're using these channels specifically for. For instance, LinkedIn is a global channel. Your content is not going to be viewed locally. So translating from, you know, translating from English to German or whatever doesn't really make sense. It needs to be much more broader focus because people who are going to engage with your content will be outside of your market unless you do paid when you do paid you can like narrow your demographics and target that's different most social media channels the most social media platforms are focused on a global distribution 
not a local first thing. TikTok is a place, for instance, that's much more like local to global kind of explosion. There, if you're focusing on local specific marketing, yeah. that makes sense. So as you are building your channel strategies, look at what the platform is good for. Don't just dump things so that you understand where you build your organic reach, where you build your paid reach. How do you target yeah. specifically? Uh, I know this is a little tangential, but I needed to like bring this tactical point because I know I've heard lots of people saying, hey, I put this whole thing out on you know, LinkedIn and I saw my post getting like you know visits from countries where I have no presence or footprint. Yeah, that's because that's the whole purpose of the channel. It's going to push you in that kind of way. It's not It's not entirely your fault. You can, of course, use hashtags and everything to be much more targeted, but even so, the nature of the platform will always guide it first more than these yeah. qualifiers that focus on an area. But yeah. Although I'll, I'll also I'll add to that that um, I'm, I'm not 100% sure how specifically with LinkedIn it works because I've, I've tested this this particular question, do we do English or German? I've tested that with three clients and myself, and the, it's just three, right? But the, the data so far is inconclusive, and that is in part seems to be caused by the fact that the, the way your network is set up Right, who already follows the company page? Is the German yeah. accounts? Is that where these people come from? Like that seems to influence it, and so there's lots of variables going into it. But I mean, getting into so I'm I'm repeating the points, right? We said think about what to whom to speak and what to say first, then have some hypothesis where to distribute, right? And then we say try and you know get at it and try to really learn and understand the channel and the messaging and that for until it works, right? And which brings us to the fourth point. Um, keep executing right until you have something that is mm -hmm. working um and only then i would say broaden the approach and maybe try your hand at the next channel right if you if you've mastered one which mastery is a difficult concept here but let's say if you've mastered one really clearly it's working most of the time it never works all of the time and everybody posts stuff that doesn't work but if the overall thing is you have that done that's when you maybe consider adding another channel um, and I, I don't know how long it takes, but um, I've rarely ever seen someone do like less than a half year of LinkedIn and get anywhere, especially if you are in very crowded spaces like management consulting. If you're a NASA astronaut and you can post pictures from space, probably your LinkedIn channel will explode in like two weeks or something, right? But not everybody gets to be in that luxury position. Uh, people like us seem, tend to have slightly more boring jobs, right? So. Give, give this time master it and only then think about the other channel. That was that was the fourth point we had here on the list. Yeah. And I see that you're talking about like guest articles and speaking events and PR, but you know, you're asking like what about those? And I think you have an answer for that, Flo. Yeah, we got that question as well, right? So so but how shouldn't I be pushing for guest articles? Should I be doing PR and so forth? Again, same idea. Presuming you don't have the resources to do metric tons of stuff. I don't, um, but just wait, uh, because if you play the game we just described above, right? Figure mm -hmm. out whom to talk to, what to say, and then execute in one channel until you really have stories, messages, content that really works. Mm -hmm. um, don't even bother with the other stuff because that will come to you is the experience. Like as you've been on other podcasts, I've been on other podcasts. We didn't pitch for those. We don't have a media agency running them. We just got invited because of what we're doing here, right? And I think the same is true. Like, do 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 something interesting on LinkedIn for a well-defined target audience for a year, and someone might come your way and ask you to write a guest article, or someone might, you know, th this these things just happen. And even if not, the 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 fourth point we just mentioned still applies. Execute until you have the channel mastered and then maybe add a next one, which could be PR, right? You could then go out and pitch yourself to trade press magazines or something. But now you have a year's worth of, I keep coming back to LinkedIn, but let's do it. You have a year's worth of LinkedIn content under your belt. So you'll have a much easier time figuring out what to pitch for an article or, or what to build a media campaign around. Because you've done that and you've seen the data and the feedback from, from the target audience, right? So for this other stuff, which is not social media, I think similar rules apply. Just save that until you have one channel working and then expand into those. Why not? And and honestly, my guess would be or my bet would be that if you play the play the game really well, you will get invitations before you think you've mastered the channel and can move on to do other things. That's just my and, experience. Yeah, I think. Exactly.
yeah yeah well that's that's all i had for today it's a nice nice follow-up for the live session i hope i think um and um yeah you have i think we have no i, I think uh we gotta let our listeners know we have another guest coming next week so uh it's a surprise for now but stay tuned Yes, uh, I can say that much. Uh, we'll we'll dive into business development and sales again, which which we don't do that often, and maybe not often enough. But if you're interested in how to run a sales pipeline for a consulting firm, like like the big guys do it, um, that episode next week might be great for you. Anyways, I'm, I'm gonna stop the recording here, Ash. I would say have a nice Friday. Uh, and a regular weekend, short weekend after doing this, right? Everybody else got to have a long one. And then I'll speak to you very soon. Bye -bye. Thanks for listening to Unbillable Hours. If you want more, tune in next week. You know where to find us. 